Learn first, O thou who aspirest unto our ancient order, that equilibrium is the basis of the work. If thou thyself hast not a sure foundation, whereon wilt thou stand to direct the forces of nature? This is uh, just a little reproduction of the design of my, uh, my panticle. Why am I talking about panticles today on Christmas Eve? It's be well, if you were with us for the last uh, uh, day or so, uh, we're just passing, we're in Capricorn now, the Queen of Discs. Oh, there's that same image right there in the Queen of Discs. Queen of Discs runs uh, uh, 20 degrees of Sagittarius, 20 degrees of Capricorn. So we're right smack dab in the middle of her territory. And we've just passed out, thank God, of the decan that's represented by the, the ten, of, 10 of Wands. And we have just begun yesterday the two of discs, and you'll notice that in the, in the, there we go there. Now, the, let's see if I've got it around here someplace. I thought I did. Uh, well, I don't know where it is. But the, the ace of discs, oh, here it is, the ace of discs, uh, is the, uh, represents, you know, Kether on the Tree of Life, the, the, the singularity. Uh, this pattern is actually four trees of life that are all joined at, at a single Kether, because Kether is the singularity, and all four trees of life spring from the singularity. So instead of four separate trees of life with four uh, separate Kethers, we've got one Kether there that is uh, 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 from which uh, emanate the, the remaining nine sephiroth of, uh, of the f four trees of life. Okay, that means that there's a total of 37. 37 is a big number in Kabbalah because it's uh, uh, the, the singularity, okay, the, uh, the, the, the unity of the of the of the soul, so I don't want to get into that too much Kabbalah stuff this morning, but I do want to talk about uh, uh, pentacles and stuff, and I've titled today's uh, uh, talk, uh, you know, Christmas Eve. Do you know where you are? Forty years ago, forty years ago on Christmas morning. Exactly 40 years ago, uh, I got up early, and for some reason, I thought it was time for me to do something incredibly magic, magical. And uh, Constance and I had a collection uh, that we collected over the the years. I don't know; it's probably about 10, 10 or years by then. Um, or, or longer, of uh, stubs, candle stubs, uh, that uh, the candles got too low on our uh, altar of the Gnostic Mass. And so we'd, you know, replace the candles uh, uh, quite often with full, new, fresh candles. And the old candles, we just, we didn't want to throw them away, didn't know what we were going to do with them. Uh, but I thought, I'm going to, we had a Christmas cookie uh, tin, a t one of those, you probably got three or four laying around the house because they're usually or ornate. I took those candles and I put them in that beautiful round uh, Christmas cookie tin and like an idiot, 
I got lucky this time. I turned the oven on warm. Okay, I mean very low. And I watched it very carefully as the candles slowly melted. Now, granted, they're paraffin candles. They're not, they're not beeswax. But I was a poor young fool. Uh, but anyway, they all melted down. And the wicks, the sort of sooty wicks, uh, were kind of floating around on the bottom. And I took uh, some tweezers and just carefully picked those wicks out. And uh, it was just a nice, almost crystal clear uh, melted wax. And then I set it aside. Now, I probably did this. Uh, the night before, as I recall, I did it the night before, so I could get up in the morning to do this uh, uh, this operation. So I cooled it overnight, and it solidified to this beautiful white, white uh, uh, wax. And uh, I turned the Christmas cookie lid or the tin upside down and sort of patted it and this disc fell out. Now, I didn't make this pantacle. I wanted to make a Sigillum de Meth, the pantacle of Dr. John D. And I had several, because I was giving classes on Enochian magic, uh, giving several uh, uh, classes and I had handouts of different sizes of uh, blow-ups of the design and one of them fit exactly over that disc. And so I took some scotch tape and rolled it up so it was like a little primitive double stick tape and I taped that uh, onto the, the wax disc and then I took uh, a pinpoint, an embroidery pinpoint, which is a little beefier of a, of a pin. And on every line and every, where one line meets another line, I pinpointed every line where one line intersects another line for this whole thing. And every line, well, it's the wrong thing. Here it is. Now I'm going to have to hold it in such a way as we see it because isn't that there we go wherever one line touches another I did a pinpoint for every one of those things the, all the little cells along the perimeter all the lines. Okay, so I wonder if I can get a better view of that for you. There we go. There are hundreds of lines. There's hundreds of dots. And I tried to make sure that I poked a little hole and made a little landmark in every every place one line touches another line and then when i peeled it off i took a straight edge a metal ruler and i carefully with a compass point scratched every line making sure i didn't Crossover 
I did this all on Christmas morning. And because there was wax involved, I had to do it sitting out on the the uh, kitchen back step. And it was cold. <laughs> it was a good thing that it was cold because I was kind of working with wax anywhere. But it took 30 months. I don't know how many hours it took me. It, it I finished it all on Christmas, okay, and uh, and this uh, truly is my consecrated working uh, Siglet de Ameth, okay, on the back, okay, I've got the, the Agala thing there on the back, and uh, so I'm just bragging here this morning and just boasting. Uh, I don't think I'd have the patience or the skill uh, or the desire uh, to do something like, uh, like that again. But my own personal magical pentacle is something else. And if you uh, were magically inclined, and if you uh, uh, consider yourself a, a magician or on a magician's path, whether it's formal or informal, and uh, of course all magicians once want uh, a wand that they can they can whip around Harry Potter style, and uh, most magicians want a magic cup of some kind so that they can uh, uh, drink their post potions and things like that, or to stick their wand into in, in sort of great rite uh, ceremonies, or a dagger. Everybody loves a magic dagger, too. It's a... But really, the very first one, first magical weapon that you need to make is the pentacle, or the disc. Okay. It's the lowest, granted, Here's what I'd like to share with you this morning. The disc represents the lowest rung on the ladder of consciousness and is the first magical weapon the magician creates in the opening act of his or her magical drama. Now, I don't know if you're in your opening act or if you're, you're in the, the fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth opening act of your your repeating magical career, but you start with that. It represents the magician's perceived understanding of his or her immediate environment. It's the blueprint of the magician's home. It is position. The place the magician first pretends to be at the beginning of the waking up process. It's the firm foundation upon which we must stand to direct the forces of nature. Just as your magical motto expresses who you are pretending to be, the disc expresses where you are pretending to be. Your motto, your motto expresses who you are pretending to be. The disc expresses where you are pretending to be. I am Frater, king of the universe. And I am... And my universe is... Okay. The disc is oh, so where you're pretending to be and where you're intending to go. The disc is your map, but it is a map you must draw yourself. So, yes, dear? I heard you yelling from the kitchen, and I just wanted to say that I'm Popeye. So. <laughs> Constance is Popeye. Do you remember that old Popeye cartoon where Wimpy dresses up and pretends to be Popeye? And Popeye says, you're not Popeye. He says, I'm Popeye. Is there not one Washington? Is there not one Lincoln? 
Is there not one Popeye? Well, that settles it. I'm Popeye. But <laughs> I digress. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Uh, you have to you to start. You have to ask yourself, where do I think I am? I'm sorry to say, but it's impossible for you to know exactly where you are in the universe. Think about it. You're sitting somewhere reading this book. You're probably you probably don't even pr know precisely which way east is. And even if you do know what east is, what is east anyway? You're not exactly standing still. You're clinging to the surface of a sphere that is spinning over a thousand miles an hour. All the while, you and the whole Earth are being hurled at an unthinkable and unvariable speed around a star 93 million miles away, which, along with you and me and the whole solar system, is being dragged around some inscrutable center of our galaxy. Add to that the fact that the entire cosmos is expanding at an enormous speed away from an incomprehensible pre-existent singularity. Know where you are? Fat chance. You have absolutely no idea where you are in the universe. Can you really be expected to know where your pretend self is positioned in the cosmos? This answer is simple. No, you can't. But you got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. Yod he vav he is where you start. Hey, who I am, where I am. This is why neophytes of the mysteries learn and regularly practice meditations and ceremonies like the rituals of the pentagram or the hexagram that require us to presume that we are operating in a set position somewhere in the cosmos. Yeah, we learn the pentagram ritual to pretend we know where east, west, north, and south is. It's as simple as that. That's the first reason we learn the pentagram ritual. The elemental flat earth reality around us. Hexagram ritual is just a step up a little. It requires us to expand our consciousness just a little bit more so that we identify with the sun surrounded by the belt of the zodiac. That's the hexagram ritual. And that's why we start with those two things. Why did it... Why did it... Why did... Sometimes does it take our teachers 10 or 15 years before they say, oh, yeah, and that's why we do that first. But I digress. The pentagram rituals oblige us to move about as if we were positioned on the surface of the earth, an apparently flat earth, in, in the center of a circle demarcated by the four directions, north, south, east, and west. The pentagram ritual requires a magician to become master of the local terrestrial microcosmic environment. Raphael, Gabriel, okay. Those are the winds. We, we, we give those directions. Okay. The, the wind in the east. Okay. Those are terrestrial winds that, that rule, if you will, the, our flat earth directions. The hexagram rituals, on the other hand, work in a bigger world of the macrocosm and force the magician to expand his or her consciousness to encompass a larger universe, literally placing the magician as the sun, surrounded by the belt of the zodiac. Both points of view are, of course, woefully inaccurate. But because you have to start somewhere... You put your pretend self in these pretend locations. 
I learned these rituals very early in my magical career because I was instructed by my teacher to do so. I really didn't know why I was practicing them. Only years later did it dawn on me that these exercises, what these exercises were doing to my consciousness and my sense of position in the universe. Think about it. When you visit a huge and crowded shopping mall, you don't always feel, or don't you always feel better when you find your location on the big you are here map? The tiny arrow points to a position on the map. Of course, you're not actually there on that little arrow, but by mentally projecting yourself there, you become armed with a degree of knowledge and understanding that enables you to find your way around the mall. It also gives you an idea of your position and size in relationship to individual stores and the immensity of the mall. As a magical weapon of the element of earth, the disc is your body and your spiritual food. And here is, let me orient it. This is an aluminum version that I did at work. I worked in a medical device laboratory and they had an optical comparator that blew this up and I could project it on a large screen so that I could do all of that tiny work. Okay. Uh, let's see. The disc is your spiritual food, bread. You know, a good disc, a good disc, actually. Now, I know this sounds funny. But when you go to uh, a, a Roman Catholic or an Orthodox or a, or a Gnostic Mass, uh, when it comes time for you to take communion, uh, they give you a round host and a round host okay sometimes a little round cake of some kind and even the wax pantacles especially when they're made of bees wax it has a wonderful honey honey kind of smell to it a good pantacle makes you deep down inside when it at first, stick it in your mouth. It does. It just does. That's why cookies are, are so irresistible. That's, that's why round cornbreads just make your mouth... It's a disc. Okay. Um, it's a spiritual food, bread, that sustains the body. It's the solid foundation upon which you will build your temple. It is also your you are here map. The disc is called the pentacle because the design you create and engrave upon its surface will represent in symbolic form all. That's pentacle. Okay. Pan mean Greek all. Okay. Now that is a pentacle. Okay, a five dominated by the, the concept of five. Pentacle, 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 pentacle. Uh, let's see. The disc is called the pentacle because the design you create and engrave upon its surface will represent in symbolic form all that you presently understand the universe to be. Obviously, coming up with a design that symbolizes absolutely everything in your universe is a pretty tall order and requires a lot of thought and meditation. You need to do it. However, 
for unless you are grounded by the disc, you cannot begin the great work. The Panticle is your yellow brick road. And you'll never get to the Emerald City to see the Wizard of Oz until you find the yellow brick road. Okay. Now, today I, I showed you we move into the two of discs. Okay. The ace of discs is not even earth yet. The aces, the number one, okay, are so pure. They are, the aces represent the pure potentiality of the element. So pure and so, so infinitely potential that they haven't even formulated yet. They haven't even projected an image, a self-image of themselves, okay? They are so pure, so potential that they just brood in an eternally smooth, homogenous, in this case, earthness. It's almost like it's almost like an earthness, potential, total potential of earth that's so blissfully even unaware of its own earthness. And in order to, to, to stir into self-earthness awareness, it has to sort of break that smoothness stir from its smoothness and somehow project an image of itself in order to look at it, to say, oh, that's what I am. And that is the period that we're in, the year, the solar year, that's the period we're in right this moment. Is this one of those moments for you where you decide to do something to manifest where you think the you who you think you are is? Is it time for you to make your own design for your own pantacle and set to work on the next phase of your magical career. Maybe so. Could be. Anyway, even if you did it in a in a symbolic way or a or a informal way. I'm going to leave you with this. This is the fifth Enochian call that activates Earth. Sapa zimai didiu odnoas takwanes adroch. Dorfar ka ozg, odfans peripsol tablior. Kasar mamaz pid nazarthof O Dlugar Zizap Zleda Kaozji Toltorgi O Zikia Siesk El Taviu O Diodil Dias Hubar Beoal Sobakonfa Kistala Uls O Kaz Queting Kakazb Kaniz O Darbs Quais Ye effi tharzi odbliora. Ye ya ledna cicles begle gi ya del. Have a wonderful Christmas Eve. We'll see you tomorrow on Christmas morning. Until then, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love and your will.